thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me up here. I've uh, spoken with Kevin before, and, and it's nice to meet you as well. Um, what I'm going to show you folks is not usually tailored to your audience. It's an audience of policymakers and academics. And so I don't want to uh, come across as an academic. Uh, I have a university degree in economics, but really, um, I'm an insurance salesman. And so I don't want to come across like we have, we're, I'm not up here to sell, I'm up here to teach. And one of the things that I want you to, to, as best as possible, take out of this presentation is with regards to why, why this works, why we need to be here. And when I think about the whys in terms of the big picture, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a comment that I believe, and I've got some data to back this up for you folks, I believe that our product has helped bridge the gap between science and the supper table. And, and what I mean by that is, and I'll just give you an example, and, I, and when I'm in front of a group of farming audience, they get it right away. 25 years ago, when fungicides came out of the universities, and the bear crop sciences, and the Monsantos, and the Syngentas of the world started trying to get into the field plots and the marketplace, quite often, farmers are concerned that they're, they, they're selling snake oil. Um, and for those of us that don't, that don't have a grasp of the English language, snake oil means it's something that you're selling that doesn't work. Interestingly though, now 25 years later, it's not snake oil. In fact, it's proven time and time again that it increases productivity, increases profitability for the farms. And there isn't hardly a farm in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba, actually in right straight through the Midwest all the way down to Mexico, that doesn't use at least one pass of fungicide. When I say that we are the bridge between the science and the supper table, there's a video that we have embedded in our presentation, one of the lines he says is, it lets you try things a little bit sooner. What it is, that, what is stopping it from feeding more people, if you have one acre of land, every one of us that's sitting here should be focusing on how many kids that one acre of land can feed. So our agronomy has to be there, our land purchases, our, all of our government policies, all of our business risk management tools will be perfectly aligned if all we think about is getting more food off that one acre of land. We believe that our product can be one slice of that, helping feed more kids. There's a line that a fellow by the name of Blake Brownridge will say in one of the videos, it helps you try things more quickly. And what that means is if everybody would have taken that fungicide example and because they were protected by a good business risk management program, because they were protected, they tried it sooner. When they tried it sooner, they grew more bushels sooner. And when they grew more bushels sooner, they fed more kids sooner. So that's what I think our goal should be in the big why because I think our job is to feed more people in a growing world. So I will also do something a little bit different than I usually do in my farming audiences. I'll, I'll, I'm going to give you a quick financial statement runaround, but we're going to try to break it down. And I'm really just here to explain how our product works. So is there a role for the private sector? Yes, there can be. Uh, as we said, we're going into our sixth year. We have 100 people that work with us and uh, we will be going other places in the world. So we believe there's a role. Think of the why. talking about it. They come up, they heard about this new insurance in Saskatchewan and he wasn't quite sure about it, gave me the name and so I went and online and looked it up and then I talked to Grant at uh, one of the farm forums and uh, I thought it was too good to be true. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't believe what, what he was trying to tell me. I was thought there, there is a, a loophole somewhere that a guy can get out of because insurance uh, doesn't usually work that way. We had a lot of conversations going back and forth about what we should do because it's not exactly a traditional path in terms of insurance. Global Ag Risk is, is you know, dollars and cents on, on what you grow. 
So 50 bushel an acre wheat crop at uh, five bucks, you know, you get $250 worth of return. And then you can add hail insurance on top per acre, say like we went $100 an acre. So they're, they're, they have a premium of X amount of dollars per acre for $100 there. And then plus on a side note, we have global ag for say 250 roughly. So we're covered for $350 an acre. The, the risk is always there on canola. And I always wanted to straight cut it. I did, never ever had, uh, had the opportunity to be covered to do it. The variety that they came out with this year was quite expensive. Um, it was a good variety. It was matched for our area. So I, I pulled the trigger and I, and I did it. And it was awesome. Uh, I'm gonna continue doing it. All I needed was, was the, the risk coverage to do it and trying to cover the expensive seat. And it's there now. So, I'm pretty sure those two swaths are going to go down the road and, and it's going to put more money in my pocket. Global Ag is, is there, you know, they're, they're extremely cost effective. Compared to our, our previous uh, insurer, they were five, six dollars an acre cheaper and we were insuring a hundred dollars an acre more. They're pushing you, use fungus, use a pedigree seed, grow that crop, don't, you know, don't skimp out on stuff. There's no influence from Global Egg to tell you how to run your farm. They just tell you, here's your platform, go and farm. I, I in my opinion, I think it's tailor-made for me because uh, I like to step outside the box and, and try new and different exciting things to be more progressive because you're, you're, you always need that progression. And w without being covered, I wouldn't be as risky, but now it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Farming is fun. So the only, the parts that I want to put out there is, is relative to this audience. The why is, is that that seed that he had is L141P, which is, is 141, is it Kevin? L140P, it's a bear crop science seed. Um, it, when we're growing canola in Western Canada, when the, when the crop grows and it, and it gets windy, it shatters. So farmers will, will uh, swath it early while it's green so it doesn't shatter. Uh, but then that's another path that you've got to go over. And then even when it's in the swath, if you get a windy day, you can have your canola in your neighbor's field. And so this way, if it's still rooted in and it's not shattering. And so it allowed him to spend that money. But that seed is $66 an acre. And so he doesn't want to try 3,000 acres at $66 an acre for something that didn't work. But this allowed him to do it. It's going to allow him to more grow, grow more canola, feed more people. So what is the risk to your farm? This is how it is. It's what does it take to grow the crop? So this is Financial Statements 101 for a farmer. What does it take to grow the crop? It's yield times price as your revenue minus your input costs of seed, fert, chemical, insurance equals your gross margin. Ours is a gross margin insurance. So this is the first step is what does it take to grow the crop? The next thing that we'll look at in a farmer's financial statements is these are the what does it take to get the job done? In other words, this is really all about management. Fuel repairs, depreciation, custom work, wages, machinery rent, this is what we're talking about. And finally, what does it take to be there? So we've got three categories. The last one, this is really just what we call how old and rich the farmer is. First two categories are all about farm management. The last one is how old and rich. Because you could rent all of your land and have all of your money sitting in Wells Fargo stock. Or you could own all of your land and not have to rent it. And not only Wells Fargo stock, but it's just an investment decision. So this is what does it take to be there. So when we put it together, it's revenue minus what it takes to grow the crop versus what it takes to get the job done minus what it takes to be there is your net profit. I'm going through this quickly because we don't have a lot of time. So this is our financial statements 101. Revenue, gross margin, net margin, net income. What we are insuring is A minus B. We are insuring line C, the gross margin. Inside and embedded in that gross margin is any, every management decision that a farmer makes. And so the scalability of our program is global because I don't need to personally know that farmer. I don't need to, see, to say to any of you guys, do you know that guy? Do you think he's any good? It all is embedded in his financial statements. Here are the trends. Cost of inputs are going up. The, the John Deere line is going up. Average revenue has to go up with it. 
This is where it gets quite interesting. This is a scatter graph. Now I realize for those of you that are statistics folks that this doesn't make sense because that line shouldn't be a straight line. This is broken down all of those farms. There are 750 pieces of data that we've gotten here that shows all of these farms that the inputs to the revenue on a five year average, so we've got 150 farms there with five years of data for each of those farms. And this is where it gets very interesting. It says there's a one to 1.74 relationship between every dollar that you put a fruit seed and chem in the ground to a dollar seventy four approximately of revenue with an R ratio of point four three five one which makes it pretty believable because they're, they're mutually exclusive events not driven by global ag. But what we ended up doing is we ended up showing this to, to some folks at Bear Crop Science and we said we believe that people who are buying our product are using more of your product. I think we should do something together. And they said, well, we'd need to have a cross-matching of data. And because of privacy laws, we're only able to use corporate uh, farms. But we had enough corporate farms that we could cross-reference data. What Bear Crop Science found um, was the sample set of data was, was the, the variance was so little because the data size was, was very large. They found that across every single product category that they sell, and across every segment of customers from the ones that bought the most to the ones that just bought a little bit, every square in that matrix bought more product by having global ag. And the reason why they're doing that is because we take away that fear. And we're going to talk a little bit when I start to teach you about how this product works. But the correlation is this. And I draw this correlation to the farmers if we have a farmer audience. We have proof, significant proof, that when people buy global ag, they put in more inputs, and when they put in more inputs, they make more money. Right now, our data set is at about 8,700 years of data, so it's very robust. So the correlation to that is folks that are buying our product and have the confidence are actually making more money. Here's how our financial summaries look. We have revenue, inputs, gross margin. What it takes to get the job done is labor, power, and machinery. What it takes to be there is a land building and finance. But you notice the costs are going up. The fixed costs on this farm, this is a southwest Saskatchewan farm, have gone from $102 an acre back in five to 13, it's up to $205 an acre. But at the same time, his inputs have gone up from $80 an acre up to $219 an acre. And at the same time, he can still sometimes not even grow a crop that's big enough to cover off the cost of his first seed and chem. Here's what we're insuring. That gross margin component that we're insured there is, is our insurance. So our concept is simple. Yield times price minus expenses equals your insurance, gross margin insurance. But here's where it gets very, very interesting. As your expenses grow, your coverage grows with global ag, and the price doesn't go up. Now, where the disconnect is on this, and Kevin wrote an interesting article in the Western Producer this year about a stressful year that he had, and he kept on farming. Where the disconnect with our reinsurers of this was there's three things that are involved in getting a rate for, for insurance. It's the load factor, which is really, in common terms, it's the things that we haven't thought of. We've got to load some rate in for it. The second thing is the frequency, and the third thing is the severity. And so what our reinsurers had a problem with is that you mean to say that we're on the hook for more money and we're not asking for any more premium? And we had to push reams upon reams of data back to these guys to say, the reason why we can do this is because the frequency is so offset. So let me put it in farmer language. You farm yourself out of trouble by putting more inputs in the ground. When you spend that extra money, yes, if Mother Nature comes and delivers you a curveball, then we'll pay out a bigger claim. But the, the likelihood of that happening is so significantly less that it actually maths out. This is the most important slide in the entire presentation. Here's how Global Ag works. So I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story of a farmer, and it's right now in January. And he's in his planning stages. How many people here are farmers, by the way? Show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you're in your planning stages right now. Kevin, you've got a pretty good idea about what you're putting in the ground. You've got some forward contractings going on. You may have to adjust a little bit uh, as the weather dictates. but. In this farm that we just showed, there's fixed costs of $205 an acre. So Mike's got $205 of risk. At this point in time, 
is where Mike would have bought a policy from us. In fact, I think he just bought last week. He bought and covered off $150 an acre of that risk. And so what Mike says is, I've got $205 an acre of risk, regardless if I get a kernel in the ground. I've got to make those payments. I've got to keep my hired men going. It, it's there no matter what. So I'm going to make sure I've got 150 of that risk. On his 10,000 acre farm, he's willing to risk $550,000. Now it's time to put the crop in, and here's where our product really shines. As he puts the crop in, and there's some seed and some fertilizer that went down, the risk went up because his variable expenses went up. But what ends up happening with Global Ag is for every dime of fert seed and chem, because it's a gross margin product, for every dime that you put down, your insurance goes up that equivalent amount. He's still got $55 an acre of risk. Then he puts on his in-crop spraying, his coverage goes up because his risk went up because he had more expenses. Every time, and this is where it gets really dicey, is fungicide season. Kevin, I think you might maybe might re make reference to this in what you talk about. Um, this is where the farmer usually quits. And think of it this way. Most people in this audience have children. If the child gets sick, you pump that child full of vitamins. If the child gets really sick, you take him to the doctor. The doctor says, take this medicine. You say, oh my gosh, it's really expensive. But you spend it anyways because it's your child. There isn't anything that you won't do. But a farmer with the existing insurance is rightfully so makes this decision. This is an economic unit. He may love his farm. She may love the entire farming operation, but it's just one plant. And there's no emotional attachment to that plant. And with the existing insurances that are in place, traditionally around the world, they quit on that plant. So when your kid was under stress, you pumped him full of vitamins. We could call that fertilizer. Pumped him full of medicine. You could call it herbicides and fungicides. What Global Ag does, because to the penny they will be the same, you can put that fungicide down and if Mother Nature comes along and gives you a frost at the end of the year and you don't get the crop off, you are to the penny the same. Even though you've spent a lot more money, and so what ends up happening is people are saying, well, if I'm okay, then why don't I try that? There's a farmer uh, down by Southwest uh, in uh, Swift Current fellow by the name of Dave Wall. He's allowed me to use his name. 2013, he had his snow cover, so his, his crop germinated nicely, but it was, there wasn't hardly any subsoil moisture. It came time to do his in-crop spraying, which is where the herbicide is, and he did a tissue sample, and it said it was short of nitrogen. So now he's got to make a decision. That plant is under stress, and this nitrogen is going to cost me an extra 20-ish bucks an acre to top dress, it's called. You mix it in with the, with the weed spray at that point in time, and you give it vitamins at the same time that you're giving it medicine. His go, no, go decision there was this. I will to the penny be whole if this doesn't come off. So he sprayed, and three days after he finished spraying, the skies opened up in 13, and he got three weeks of rain. And he estimates that on average on his farm, he made an extra $30 an acre, and his policy cost him 11 so he's $19 an acre to the good. On a 7,200-acre farm, that's about $140,000 extra in his genes. And here's what's unique about that situation. I think, I'm not certain, but I think we might be the very first insured, insurer relationship in the world where you can have win-win. Because in that example, we got $11 of premium from Dave Wall, and we never paid him out, so the insurance company won. But he also got an additional $30 of revenue for a net of $19 an acre. He didn't receive a payout, and he won too. It, it affects behavior. So going back, to that, going back to that one acre of land, feeding as many people as possible, if we can design policies that positively affect agronomic behavior so that the farmer is willing to try it, and we have a risk management program that's strong enough to back them, so they will continue to try it, in other words, they don't get frightened, then chances are it might rain three days later and you might grow more bushels and feed more people. So, carrying on. Desiccation, out west we have to kill our plants so we can harvest them. This is, coverage goes up. What we're looking for at the time when we've got the maximum risk is we want this to happen. Oh, sorry, I'll do this first. Along the way there, You've got a banker that's very, very happy. Because at the start of the year, banker says, well, I see, Mike, you're on the hook for $55 an acre of risk. 
all the way along the way because we, we followed them step for step for step for every input that they put in. There's no extra additional risk to that farm for farming it perfectly other than that $55 an acre of risk. And so when your line of credit starts to get a little tight as a farmer and you want to put on that second pass of fungicide, the banker goes, oh, I don't know. The farmer goes, I've got this policy. We're good. Back to the bear crop science story because this is happening. Bear Crop Science has decided to join with Global Egg last year and they wanted to renew for a long period this year. If you own a Global Egg policy, Bear Crop Science will give you 4% off of anything that you buy from them. It's indirectly a subsidy of our product, even though it's got, they're paying, they have to buy the Bear product. It's about a 10% subsidy, give or take, private industry. Here's what we want to happen, though. We have a good harvest. We made more money than what we spent. Life is good. Here's what can happen. We have a poor harvest. We make that farm whole by taking them up to that $150 an acre, or in other words, $55 a risk is all it is. So because that's the most important point, I'm just going to run out a different way. You have your fixed cost. You covered 150 of the 205. And every time you started your sprayer, put more inputs into the ground, nutrients, genetics, your coverage went up. So you notice that there's no extra risk right from day one. Coverage goes up for no extra premium. That's how it works. Um, our paperwork's easy. This is, that's more of a farming audience. Here's what's interesting, though. This is important. Banks are using this as collateral now. Now, it's not widespread and it's not wholesale, and we're actually probably in the process of signing a deal with another bank, a major one, in the next little while. Farmers like to tie their land up to buy more land because it makes them feel like they're growing. But farmers don't like to tie their land up to put the inputs into that land that they already have. Our policy, because it is that income guaranteed to come in, allows these farmers to go to their bank and say, can I borrow money against this policy? So it's not, be, not only is it just, not only is it only being assigned, in other words, if you run into trouble, get it, they're actually removing land off of mortgages because this is easier to get money out of the insurance company than it is to go through legal guys to get the land from the farmer. It's embarrassing to the farmer, banker looks bad, but even though the farmer might have been a bad farmer, banker still comes out as a bad guy. This way it's just like, well, he's covered for this much, we're good. If he gets in trouble, check comes to us and the farmer. No lawyers, everything's clean. We pay our claims out. Really, the claims, we get the corporate year end. Um, in fact, we're even just going off of good bank records reconciled with general ledgers now. So our first claims checks for 2015 went out about two months ago. We give them, the farmer, the final payment or in and around May 1st. So they have entirely got all of their claim before they end up putting their crop in for the next year. These are our reinsurers, some of the biggest of the big. Very common to all the BRM programs across Canada. The reinsurance that BRM programs buy are the same reinsurers that we use. These are our representatives right now that we've got across Western Canada. Every one of those uh, little marks there is where we've got people working for us that are marketing the product. So it's not as much penetration as we'd like to have, but we'd like to have more, especially in Manitoba. Uh, we're going to Ontario. We'll be in BC. Um, issues that we have is regulatory-wise. Sometimes regulatory-wise we, we run into hurdles. In other words, the ability to actually sell the product. We're competing against high subsidies. Um, when, we first started selling, when we first started selling the product, uh, we, had, uh, we were competing against egg stability that triggered at 85% and paid out 85%. So it paid out more and it was virtually free. So and it, most people would think we we're crazy, but we felt as though the programs were going to change, so we got up and running. In that last year, I've got one of our shareholders that actually made about $50,000 on top of the $100,000 that him and his wife were paid as salary. So they made about $150,000. And they also got a $400,000 egg stability payment. So the old program, the way it was, was a very strong support program for farmers. But unfortunately, from a policy perspective, 
it was, subsidization the, it was subsidizing the chronically profitable. The more profitable you were, the more you got paid. This program that we do is never ever marketed by saying us, not them. What our job is to do is to teach where all of the business risk management programs trigger, where they fit, including private hail. We don't sell private hail, but we give a lot of counsel on private hail because we think farmers should buy it. My name is Blake Brownridge. I am uh, owner of Higher Yield Egg Solutions. I farm in southeast Saskatchewan and I farm roughly around 10,000 acres small grains. If you're a producer that puts everything that you can into your crop, 110%, then this is a program for that producer. What I really like about Global Egg Risk is I'm rewarded for what I do on my farm. As my gross margin increases, decreases, it's a total business model of my farm to a certain extent and my coverage goes over and above that or where I need my coverage to fit in with my farm. That's what I like about it. If I try to do different things and go out there and, and prove that they work and I'm a step ahead of somebody else, then I know that I'm covered for the day that that doesn't work. What appealed to us on our farm on Global Agri Solutions was uh, the idea of insuring our farm on the dollars, not specifically on a crop or a coverage or a bushel or and the independence, not being tied into our neighbors or the different operations around Saskatchewan, not necessarily here in the southeast, but uh, kind of developing an insurance program for our farm. When we called into the office and told them that we had had our hail, um, there was right away no hesitation on, okay, well, you're insured for this amount of dollars, go ahead and do whatever you need to do to get that crop back up and running. Um, so you do sleep a little bit easier knowing that if you like we had just finished spraying 3,000 acres of fungicide the night before the hailstorm came. So that was on the majority of the land that was hailed uh, 100%. So very disheartening to pick yourself up in the morning and go back and wonder what you're going to do. But we knew if the opportunity arose that we could spray it again, that the coverage was there. And uh, the nice part about Global was that if our crop was late, which it was, and we did freeze, we were insured on that end also, not just getting a check for hail insurance or a check for this or a check for that, but we were covered right through the growing season. That's what makes the, the whole concept a better thing for me. It probably lets us be a little more aggressive because we know what we're insured for going into it. Uh, lets us diversify into some uh, larger input crops, corn, soybeans, sunflowers, are getting to be pretty common practice in this area. And it's let us forward contract a lot more green with knowing that we have a dollar per acre coverage, not necessarily a bushel coverage or there'll be a difference on that. So what I would tell other producers that are thinking about global egg risk is to probably know your numbers very well, sit down, talk to them in the office, understand what your coverage is for and use that coverage to benefit your farm. And know that at the end of the day that you are covered for the dollars that you put in your crop. And it definitely lets you be more aggressive and I think it is, it's an easier way to, to farm. Just you sleep a lot better at night. The only thing I'd add about Global Egg Risk is so far being in the first year here, uh, working with everybody was, was really good. We probably had more contact uh, with them than we've had with our other insurance the last five or six years, just the way our growing season went. So in saying that, I think it was a very easy program. The paperwork was easy to use. Um, so no overall it was a very good experience. So just to wrap up, and I'll be quick here, Morris. They had three hailstorms. His wife said, for sure we'd have sprayed after the first one. Probably would have sprayed after the second one, but there's no way we would have gone at it again and sprayed after the third one. They farmed themselves out of a claim. They had two neighbors on either side of them that had similar amount of hail in their hailstorms. Their current insurer that they had said, you know what, it's okay, you can disc it under. They literally disced their crop under. He ended up growing $35 an acre gross margin more than what he was covered for. So on that, on that farm, there was an additional $350,000 in their genes because he farmed the heck out of it. So that's what our product does. And we'll ask answer questions later. Is that what you wish? Thank you.